Oh, everybody hear me? It's hard to speak when you're sitting down. You've got a bent windpipe. And okay, fine. First Corinthians 12 and verse 1. We're going to read verse 1 through verse 11. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Now there are diversities of gifts but the same Spirit, and there are differences of administrations but the same Lord, and there are diversities of operations but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Now, I would like us to examine these nine sign gifts this morning under three main topical headings. By the way, I just want to mention at this point that this entire lecture series, as you can see, is all printed up in study outline form. And if you would like a complete copy of this, uh, you put your name and address on a piece of paper here. I'll leave a piece of paper up front and I'll see that you get it, okay? So uh, you can take notes if you wish, but everything we're going to cover and then some is already in here. And so if that takes the burden of, of note-taking off, uh, thank the Lord, okay. All right, three things. Number one, the place of these nine sign gifts, the place in God's timetable. Secondly, the people involved in performing the sign gifts. And thirdly, the purpose of the sign gifts. The place, the people, and the purpose. First of all, as to the place of the sign gifts, may I just share two points of discussion. Number one, signs, whether they were miracles, uh, visions, uh, words of prophecy, direct revelations, healings, whatever, raising people from the dead, miracles or signs, period, were given primarily to the people of Israel. Signs have absolutely no application whatsoever to the Gentile peoples. They were given exclusively to the Jew in the apostolic day to confirm the message of the apostles to the Jew and to show the Jew that God was setting aside Judaism and bringing in something brand new. And he gave the apostles primarily the power to do these miracles to give evidence and credibility to their message. Because they had no thus saith the Lord to go by, all they had was the Old Testament which essentially says nothing about the church the whole concept of the church and the body of Christ and the mystery of Jew and Gentile in one body, all of these concepts and truths were, as Paul says in Ephesians, hidden from the fathers, hidden from the people in Old Testament times. They knew nothing of this. So the apostles were given power to do miracles in order to say to the Jew, hey, this is for real. Hey, this is of God. We can prove it by thus and so. Okay? I think every Jew was uh, ultimately from Missouri. You know, they had to see it to believe it. That was their religious mentality. We would see a sign from thee, Master. And Jesus had to say to them, except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. And so signs and miracles and wonders and supernatural tokens were given to the Jew. They had no application to the Gentile whatsoever. While you're in Corinthians, look at chapter 1. <clears throat> just to kind of substantiate that and nail down that principle a little bit. Chapter 1, verse 22. Read it with me. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Essentially, a Greek was anybody who wasn't a Jew. Okay? And so the Greeks could care less about signs. 
They could care less about supernatural phenomena. They sought after wisdom. They were the agnostics. They were the intellectuals of the day. They liked to argue. They liked to talk philosophy. They liked to talk on a, on a philosophical level. As far as signs and wonders and supernatural phenomena, eh, who cares? But the mentality of the Jew was that he had to see signs. The word require is the Greek word aitima, which means crave. The Jews crave signs. And so signs were given primarily to the Jew to confirm the apostolic message to them. Now look at Acts chapter 9, verse 42. When signs, be it miracles of healing, be it speaking in tongues, be it seeing visions or whatever, when signs were performed before the Jew, they generally always resulted in conversions. They were of that mentality that they wanted to see tangible evidence, and so God gave them, in his mercy, tangible evidence, and it had a good result. Notice chapter 9, you know the story. Uh, Peter raises Dorcas, or Tabitha, from the dead. And what was the result of that miracle? Verse 42, it was known throughout all Joppa, and what happened? Many believed in the Lord. So whenever miracles were performed in, for, in front of the Jew, it generally resu resulted in conversions. Peter and John healed the man at the temple, and 5,000 Jews were saved. They spoke in other languages on the day of Pentecost, and 3,000 Jews were saved. And so signs are Jewish in flavor. Now, you go to chapter 14, and I, don't have, I won't take the time to read all of these verses, but you go to chapter 14 and you see a sign or a miracle of healing performed in front of Gentiles. And what was the result? When Paul healed the impotent man at Lystra, what did they do? Why, they brought garlands and they were going to worship the apostles. They called, uh, uh, let's look at it here, they called Barnabas in verse 12, they called him Jupiter, and they called Paul Mercurius because he was the chief speaker, and they brought garlands and would have done sacrifice to them. And then when Paul and Barnabas ran in among them and tried to convince them, hey, we're just ordinary men like you, don't worship us, worship the true God, and so on and so forth, they just, even with those words, barely kept the people from worshiping them. And then as fickle as the Gentile heathen were, the superstitious heathen, when the Jews uh, uh, came down and persuaded them, then they turned just 180 degrees and stoned Paul. So you see, when miracles were performed before the Jew, it generally resulted in conversion, a plus result. But when signs were done in front of Gentiles, it resulted in utter chaos and confusion. And so miracles and healing and tongues and signs and wonders were not given to the Gentile. They have no place in front of the Gentile. They were given to the Jew, and primarily to the Jew, in the apostolic age to confirm the apostolic message to the nation of Israel. Now let's go to Mark's Gospel, chapter 16. I want to get this point firmly cemented in your mind, because I know that you're being confronted every day with people on the job or in the neighborhood or whatever that tell you that you're somehow second-rate because you haven't experienced healing or because you can't speak in tongues or because you can't do this or that, uh, you, well, you may be saved, but, uh, you know, <laughs> you're, you're kind of a low man on the proverbial totem pole. You see, we're living in a very experience-oriented society. If I see it, I'll believe it. I've got to touch something, feel something, experience something. This is the mentality of people today. And they have an insatiable appetite to see, to feel, to experience. Faith is not enough for people anymore. For all their talk about faith, if you have enough faith, you'll speak in tongues. If you have enough faith, you'll see healings. If you have enough faith, you'll be have health, wealth, and happiness. That's not faith. That is the very opposite of faith. That's having to see something before you believe it. But Hebrews 11 says faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We walk by faith and not by sight. So for all their talk about faith, it's really the opposite of faith that they're putting forth, that they're advancing. Now Mark 16, verse 15. 
He said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing it shall not hurt them. They shall lay their hands on the sick and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God, and they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs. Okay? Now, several things we can lift out of that. Number one, he tells them, go preach the gospel. What gospel? The gospel he told them to preach had not been written. All they had was Genesis to Malachi and 150 million other editions that the rabbinical custom had come along with. What gospel, pray tell, were they to preach? They were challenged to go out to the Jewish nation with a message that was not recorded. How is the Jewish nation going to respond to this unwritten message? How are the Jews which knew the Old Testament like the back of their hand, and that's all they knew, they ate it, slept it, thought it, and drank it, how are they going to respond to this message which seems to set aside entirely their written revelation for something totally new? How in the world are they going to get it across to them and convince them that, hey, this is of God? So they were per commanded to preach an unwritten gospel, they were also commanded to preach this unwritten gospel to who primarily first? Romans 1.16, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Uh, Paul says in Acts to the Jews, it was necessary that the word of God first be preached to you. But seeing how you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, from now on we're going to the Gentiles. But the point is, just put yourself in the shoes of the apostles. You're commanded to preach a gospel which has not been written down or recorded, a gospel which seems to contradict and set aside the Old Testament law, a gospel which is unpopular, unheard of, unwritten, and unknown, and to preach it to the Jew, who hated the sight of you anyway. Now, how in the world are you going to pull it off? The Lord in his mercy, it says in verse 20, confirm the word with signs. Now, do, just, just bear with me a second. I'm not even sure I can pronounce these right. Bebeyu, I think that's close enough for government work anyway, translated confirming means to make it sure, to establish. In other words, God established the message of these apostles. He made it sure in the minds of their audience. He gave public credibility to their message. By doing what? By giving them signs. The Greek word semeion means a clear, unmistakable uh, evidence of the supernatural. A clear, unmistakable evidence of the supernatural which is given as a sort of badge to confirm something. So again, the purpose of signs, uh, rather the place of signs, uh, was uh, the confirmation of the gospel to the Jewish people. Now let's look at Hebrews chapter 2. It would be good for you to memorize these portions of Scripture and study them through and analyze the Greek text and get expanded definitions of these words so when you're confronted with people, you can give them a short encapsulated explanation of these verses. Brother. What are, what are who talking about? What are a lot, a lot of people uh, may say, gee, you know, speaking in tongues or whatnot. They say, well, read Mark chapter 16, 15 through 18. Okay, they refer you to that because they feel that there is still a need for those kind of signs today. Yeah. See? They feel that if you can speak in tongues, if you can heal, if you can do bizarre things like handling poisonous snakes and you don't die, if you can do these bizarre things, these otherworldly things, then that will confirm your message to the world. In other words, what all they're saying is, hey, yeah, we agree that these signs were given to confirm the message of the apostles, but what we're saying is that we still need these signs. And that's where the rub comes in. 
we'd like to attempt to prove this morning that we don't need these signs. They needed these signs, the apostles, because they had no written, thus saith the Lord. They couldn't go to the Jew and say, hey, it says in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, or, hey, it says in Romans 6, 14, or, hey, it says in Colossians 3, 11, because those books weren't written yet. The whole thing hinges on the fact that the apostolic infant church did not have the New Testament to confirm the doctrines of the church. And so the Lord confirmed and gave credence to their message by these supernatural phenomena. Those who insist that they must have that supernatural phenomena today in a roundabout way are really saying, hey, the word isn't enough. We've got to have signs to prove it. We're saying, hey, the word is enough now. God's revelation to man is complete. There's a thus saith the Lord now for all matters of faith and practice. And therefore, we don't need to have this word confirmed with something extra biblical. We don't need to see anything tangible to give credence to this word. God has spoken. And faith in the word is enough. They're saying, no, it's not enough. We still have to see these bizarre happenings. Now, in Hebrews 2, notice verse 2. For the word, if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Okay? Three things out of that passage. Number one, who is he addressing? What's the title of the book? Hebrews. Remember, signs are Jewish. These were Hebrew people, most of whom were genuinely saved, some of whom perhaps had at least embraced the gospel outwardly, attracted because of all the peripheral benefits they saw in it. But essentially, he's addressing Hebrews. And when he says, how shall we escape? If we neglect this great salvation, he's referring to we Jews. Now, that's true that Gentiles won't escape either, but an application, but primarily he's addressing the Jewish community. And then he's saying, listen, this great salvation was first preached by the Lord, and afterward it was confirmed to us by them that heard him. Who, who is he talking about there? Who are the them that heard him? The apostles. He's saying, listen, Hebrew people, the Lord first proved his messianic credentials to us as a nation by his miracles, and then afterward, them that heard him, the apostles, likewise confirmed the message unto us by miracles and wonders and signs. Therefore, we Jews have no excuse. Now, just keep your place there for a second and go back to Acts. If, if nothing else, you'll learn how to flip the books of the Bible this morning. Acts chapter 2. Here's what he's talking about. Acts 2, verse 22. Ye men of Israel. We're still in Jewish flavor, aren't we? Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man, what's the next word? Approved among you by what? miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you. Let me just say this. Jesus did not heal people because he loved them. Does that shock you? Jesus did not heal people because he loved them. If he healed people because he loved them, then that means there must have been a whole lot of people that he didn't love because there's a whole lot of people that he didn't heal. He didn't heal everybody. Jesus did not heal or perform miracles because he loved people. He died on the cross because he loved people. Jesus healed for one purpose only, to prove his messianic credentials, period, to the Jew. To prove to the Jewish nation, here was the Messiah. Here was one who could raise the dead, heal the sick, cleanse lepers with the word, open deaf ears and, and unstop stop tongues and give lame people the ability to walk and dead people the ability to live. Here is one proven, the word approved there, by the way, 
uh, is a Greek word that means to demonstrate and accredit as being true. Peter says, God demonstrated and accredited Jesus of Nazareth to be the true Messiah by the miracles and wonders and signs which he did. And so the only reason Jesus did supernatural phenomena was to give credibility to his messianic claims to the people of Israel. And then back in Hebrews 2, Paul says, and then them that heard him, meaning the apostles, likewise, verse 4, God also bearing them witness, the apostles, with what? Signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost. So Paul is saying to Hebrew people, listen, <clears throat> your own Messiah was confirmed as such among you by the miracles that he did, and his hand-picked chosen official heralds of the new dispensation, the apostles, were likewise confirmed to us Jews by miracles and wonders and signs. Okay? So signs, miracles, wonders, supernatural phenomena were given to the New Testament apostolic church in its infancy in order to confirm the apostolic message. Let's suppose you're all Jews, and we're back now in the streets of Antioch at A.D. 42. And uh, all you know is Judaism. You've, you've cut your eye teeth on Judaism. You know the law backwards and forwards. And I come into your synagogue and I begin to preach to you that Jesus is Christ, that he is Messiah, that God has raised him from the dead, and that Judaism and all of its rituals being set aside, and that God is bringing in something new. And you say, ha, eat a bug, literally, prove it. And you know, you're all skeptical. But maybe one of you have a sick child at the point of death. And I come over to that sick child, and in the name of Jesus, Messiah, in the name of Jesus, the Christ, that child is healed. Now what are you going to think? See, now you're going to say, oh, well, boy. Because all throughout the book of Acts, when they said, by what power and by whose name have you done this, to Peter and John? And what did Peter and John say? By the name of Jesus Christ, that is, Jesus, Messiah, whom you crucified, whom God raised up, by this name does this man stand here before you whole. And so you can see then that the signs were given to the apostles to prove the messianic credentials of Jesus, the setting aside of Judaism, and the bringing in of something new. Okay? Now, Acts chapter 14, if you would. Not only were signs, miracles, and wonders given to confirm the apostolic message, but I want to point out perhaps more specifically too now that they were given for a certain time frame. May I say that God is no longer interested in confirming the apostolic message to the Jew through signs because God has categorically set the Jew aside, you see? So point number one was that God gave these supernatural events to confirm the word to the Jew by the apostles, but only for a certain time frame. And after a certain time frame, signs ceased because they were no longer important. They no longer figured. They had outlived their importance. Now in Acts chapter 14, verse 3, Long time therefore abode they, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Okay? First of all, the word of his grace is a reference to the New Testament, which again had what? Not yet been written. But they were preaching the word of his grace, which they got by direct revelation. But God gave testimony. The word is martyrio, from where we get our word martyr. It means a witness, a public witness. To, he, in other words, God gave public witness, public evidence of the truthfulness of this message by signs and wonders. But now I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And the old perennial controversy comes into play. When did signs and wonders cease? <clears throat> now, 
Chapter 13, verse 8. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. So far. Let's lift some things out of there. First of all, the word fail is maybe a little unfortunate because it sounds like prophecies won't come to pass. That's not what it means. The word fail is a Greek word that means that these prophecies will become totally idle. They will become eventually of no effect. They will become useless. They will come to nothing, and they will be rendered null and void. Paul is saying, listen, these direct revelations that people are now getting from God will eventually become useless and null and void. All right. Then he says, uh, tongues shall cease. Now, that's a different Greek word, and it's a heavy verb. It means that they'll stop right now. It's like Paul is pounding the pulpit and saying, this tongues business is going to stop right now. It will stop, cease, quit, and desist. And then he says, knowledge shall vanish away. And the words vanish away are the same Greek word as the word fail. And so prophesying and knowledge would eventually become useless. They would eventually come to nothing. They would be rendered null and void. Now, when will prophesying and tongues and knowledge stop, quit, cease, desist, become null and void? Verse 10, when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Now, explanation number 14C that you always hear about this is this. Well, that means when Jesus comes, then everything else is done away, and therefore, tongues and prophesying and knowledge will continue right up until the time Jesus comes and then quit. Well, that sounds good, but unfortunately it's not true. Verse 10 does not say, when he which is perfect is come. It says, when that which is perfect is come. Now, I don't want to build a big federal case upon, about gender here, because in the Greek language, male and female gender in words do not necessarily mean men and women, okay? If a, if a word is masculine in gender, it refers to a concrete, definite thing or person. If it is feminine gender, it refers to an abstract idea, as well as neuter in gender. This word, uh, perfect, teleios, is, is of that way, it's referring to an idea. Some idea, some abstract thing is going to come that will make something else pass away. I have a difficult time thinking of my Lord as an abstract idea, do you? It does not say when he is come, but when this abstract thing is come. What is this abstract thing that would come, that would make an end to this kind of thing? All right? To let us means something that is complete, something that is fully grown, something that is final and finished. It comes from the base of the Greek verb telos, which means the conclusion or the termination of something. Now, what was the full, final, finished, completed thing that would come and set aside the need for prophesying tongues and miracle gifts? You're holding it in your hands. The whole New Testament. Paul says, it is given unto me to fulfill the word of God. Literally, we could turn that around because pleruo in Greek means to fill full, to make it replete, to cap it off, to finish it. Paul says, listen, the New Testament revelations were given to me, and it is my particular ministry to fill up and complete and finalize and cap off and finish God's revelation to man. And when that revelation is finished, then this prophesying is done away. And you say, well, wait a minute. It says knowledge shall cease. Well, certainly we still have knowledge today, but he's not talking about the knowledge that we gain today by studying the scriptures. He's referring us back to chapter 12. In fact, if you take chapters 12, 13, and 14 as a unit, you'll have no trouble deciphering what prophesying and knowledge he's talking about here. The prophecies that will come to nothing 
that he's speaking of here, were these direct revelations about future events. They would stop and cease and quit when the full finished word would come. Anybody today who says he's getting revelations from God about future events is coming under the anathema of Revelation 22, which says that anyone who tries to add to the words of the prophecy of this book, God will add to him the plagues that are written in it. And the word of knowledge he's speaking of here, which would quit, stop, cease, and desist when the perfect thing comes, were actual direct revelations of knowledge. Now let me give you a for instance. Let's look at the chart here for a sample, for, for a second, and notice the cross, which of course is the center uh, between the Old and the New Covenant. You have the ascension of Christ and the descent of the Holy Ghost at Pentecost, which essentially began this New Testament era. But if you please, there was a transition period where we were now gradually moving away from Judaism and gradually moving into the principles of Christianity. God didn't just turn off Judaism like a switch and pull another switch and boom, we were immediately in the full-blown principles of Christianity. The one gradually phased out, the other gradually phased in. And it's in that transitional period that the New Testament church had nothing to go on. Let's say, for example, again, we're all Jews and we're all converted Jews and it's now A.D. 42 in Jerusalem. How in the world are we as a New Testament body of believers going to function when we don't have a New Testament? We can't turn to Ephesians and Colossians and Corinthians and get church truth. We can't turn to Hebrews. We can't turn to Revelation. None of these books were written yet. The first book of the New Testament, namely the Gospel of Matthew, uh, wasn't written until A.D. 37. And Paul's epistles, which give us the bulk of New Testament church truth, were not written till between A.D. 54 and A.D. 67, some 21 to 34 years after Pentecost. And Revelation, which is the bulk of prophecy concerning the future of the church and the world and the kingdom age, were not, was not written till A.D. 96, which was 63 years after Pentecost. And then, of course, there were no printing presses, so we're talking about another at least 50 years before all these books were compiled and copied and in sufficient circulation among the churches. So when it comes right down to the nitty-gritty, for about the first hundred years of the church's existence, they didn't have the New Testament to go by. And so God had to give them, as he says here in chapter 13, we know in part, and we prophesy in part, the Greek word is melos, again, which means a, a small proportion, a small allotment. Paul says right now, as of this particular juncture, since we don't have the New Testament, we only know in part. God gave through direct revelation a little bit here and a little bit there and here a piece and there a piece and here a part and there a part to give the New Testament something to go by so that they could function and operate. But Paul says when this revelation is complete, when it's full, when it's final, and when it's finished, then we won't need to get these bits and pieces anymore. The need for direct revelations will have been put away because we'll have the whole thing intact. And that, my friend, is the whole concept. The whole, the whole thing hinges on the fact of the Word of God. Now let's go to Acts 2. We've talked about the place that these gifts occupied. <clears throat> now in Acts chapter 2, verse 43, we see the people that were mostly involved. Let's not get the impression that every John Q. Pew warmer performs signs and wonders. It's just not that way. Now, the charismatic people will tell you today that, man, you've got to do these wonders. You have to at least speak in tongues. I mean, man, if you can't do that, you haven't arrived. And so miracles and signs and wonders are purported today to be something that every Christian should be involved with. Hey, every Christian wasn't involved with it back then. Why should they be now? To one, the word of wisdom. To another, the gift of tongues. To another, this. And to another, that. Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? What's the obvious answer to those questions? No. 
Now notice chapter 2 of Acts, verse 43. Read it with me. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by everybody and their brother. No, by the apostles. That's important. Chapter 5, verse 12. Read it with me. And by the hands of every person. Huh? By the hands of every Christian. No, by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. So the place of signs, again, was to confirm the messianic credentials of Christ and the apostolic credentials of the apostles to the Jew in the infant church prior to the completion of Scripture. That's the place. The people, generally, there are exceptions to this, but the people, generally, were the apostles because it was their job to lay the groundwork for the church. The church is built on what foundation? Part? Ah, I'm glad you said that. I thought you'd say Christ, and he is. He is the church's personal foundation. Other foundation can no man lay that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He is the personal foundation. There is no other. But the apostles and prophets laid the doctrinal foundation because they got direct revelations and delineated them to us in the New Testament. And so the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Therefore, it was most important that the apostles and prophets be given signs. Paul speaks, he says, the signs of an apostle were wrought among you by me. Okay? So the people primarily involved were the apostles, not the rank and file. Thirdly and finally, let's take a look at the purpose for these signs. And may I suggest three of them. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 12 now for a second. And let's take a look at the purpose for signs. Now, I'd like to divide these nine gifts up in these three categories. From verses 8 to 10, they're not really given in any order, per se, any important order. But I'd like to take them out and arrange them in topics. May I say that purpose number one, again, was instruction. They were given to teach and ground the New Testament churches so that they could function on New Testament ground by using New Testament principles until the New Testament was given and essentially the gifts of wisdom, knowledge, and prophecy. These were actually, in bits and pieces, dribs and drabs, direct revelations given not to all, but to some. And they and then would teach these revelations to the saints, and thereby they could function on New Testament ground. Let me give you an example. Colossians 3.11 says that in Christ there is neither Jew or Gentile. But the Jew and Gentile were to be one body. In Ephesians chapter 2, we're told that God has made both, Jew and Gentile, one body. And that both, Jew and Gentile, have access to the Father by one spirit. Now, tell me something. Is that an Old Testament concept or a new? You bet it's a new one. This was unheard of. Paul says in Ephesians 3 that this was unheard of, that Jew and Gentile would be fellow heirs fellow participants, co-participants in the body. This was totally New Testament. Now, let's go back to Acts chapter 10. You know the story. The salvation of Cornelius and his household. Peter is up on the housetop of Simon the Tanner, and he gets a vision. And notice chapter 10, verse 9. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour, and he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowl of the air. And there came a voice to him saying, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And uh, the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. 
Now, you can imagine being a good Jewish boy up there on the housetop and seeing all these yucky things coming down on the sheet, things that you would totally unkosher. I mean, you wouldn't have touched this stuff with a 10-foot pole. But now God is trying to get across to Peter that there's a whole new order of things coming. That we were no longer going to be under all these rules and dietary laws and regulations and we were not to call any man common or profane or unclean. But the Jew and Gentile alike were going to be welcomed into the gospel. Now, you say, well, why didn't Peter just turn up to Colossians 3.11 and see that in, Jew, in Christ there's neither Jew or Gentile? Why didn't he? Because it wasn't written yet. I'm going to pound this home. If we get nothing out of that, we need to see that this was the purpose of these things. All right? So to make a long story longer, he goes down to Cornelius' home. In verse 25, Peter was coming in. Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. And Peter said, you're right, man. You ought to worship me. I'm a Jew and you're a dirty old low-down Gentile. No. Peter said, stand up. I myself also a man. Verse 28. And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. What law was Peter referring to here? The Old Testament. But God hath showed me. I was reading in Ephesians chapter 2 this morning in my devotions, and God showed me that there was to be one body. Right? No. Oh, uh, God has showed me from Colossians 3.11 that there's neither Jew or Gentile. No. God showed me through what? A direct revelation, a word of knowledge, a word of prophecy, a vision, if you please. Now we have Colossians 3.11, and now we have Ephesians 2. We can see in simple black and white that there's to be no distinction between Jew and Gentile. We don't need to see sheets let down out of heaven, you see? A word of knowledge. Secondly, a word of protection. Look at Acts chapter 15. <clears throat> now, the gift that figures here is the gift of discerning spirits. Now, we're told in chapter 4 of 1 John to test the spirits because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Okay? And... Uh, if you think that's something new, you haven't read your Bible right, because John goes on to say in his epistle, even now are there many antichrists. So there were false prophets then. I mean, it wasn't long. I mean, the ink wasn't dry on the church roster before Satan had false teachers coming in among the apostolic churches. How were they to discern spirits? Notice chapter, five, or chapter 15, verse 5. There were certain... Uh, there, uh, sorry there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and command them to keep the law of Moses. They were saying, all right, uh, w you know, the Cornelius situation proved to us that I guess the Gentiles can be saved, but they've got to become Jewish. They've got to get circumcised and they've got to put their necks under the yoke of the Levitical law. They've got to submit to temple ritual and temple worship and, and offer sacrifices. It's okay that they'll be saved, but they've got to become one of us. Now, if you were back there, in, especially in the province of Galatia, and you were uh, newly converted, how would you know that they weren't telling you the truth? Well, you say, doesn't Romans 6.14 tell us that we're no longer under the law but under grace? Yes. But what happened? Romans 6.14 hadn't been written yet, had it? So you had no thus saith the Lord to show you that you were no longer under the law. You didn't have Romans 10.4 that said Christ was the end of the law because Romans 10.4 hadn't been written yet. All right, uh, chapter 15, verse 1. Certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Now notice, when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them. Question, what made Paul and Barnabas so cocksure that these guys weren't telling the truth? How could they so boldly uh, find dissension with them and dispute them over this? They didn't have Romans 10.4. They didn't have uh, Romans 6.14. They didn't have any thus saith the Lord to go by that said we were no longer under the law but under grace. What gave Paul and Barnabas the inner sense 
the sort of sixth sense that these fellows weren't telling the truth. They had the gift of discerning spirits. Do we have a gift of discerning spirits today? No. You don't need it. Why? Because every Christian now, with a careful perusal of the Word of God, can discern the spirits. And when you hear somebody on radio or television or whatever teaching something and purporting something to be true, you can turn to a thus saith the Lord and you can see whether he's true or not, can't you? But they couldn't because they didn't have the Word of God. All they had was the Old Testament. And that's what these guys were talking. They were talking Old Testament, weren't they? And so the gift of discerning spirits was given to this one or that one or this one to protect the early infant churches against error and perversion. Now that we have the completed word of God, we don't need the gift of discerning spirits. We can all discern the spirits by studying the scriptures in their completed form. Finally, the sign gifts were given for confirmation, as we said before. Now, as for example, in Acts chapter 6, verse 8, uh, we're introduced to Stephen. In Acts 6, verse 8, it says, Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Now, what was the result of Stephen's gift of faith and gift of miracles? The Jewish Sanhedrin were silenced. These great learned doctors of the law were put to silence and publicly made foolish because of Stephen's wisdom. It says they could not resist the spirit or the wisdom by which he spake. They were con all they could do was get mad and try to kill him, and they did. But faith and miracles resulted in the Jewish Sanhedrin being silenced publicly. Uh, in Acts chapter 9, verse 41, again, when Paul, or uh, sorry, when Peter raised Dorcas from the dead, it resulted in the conversion of many Jews. Uh, in Acts chapter 13, uh, an example of the Apostle Paul, verse 6, when they had gone through the Isle of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elamus, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn the deputy away from the faith. Then Paul, who was also called, uh, sorry, sorry, then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, Wilt thou not seek to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, what happened? He believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Miracles, faith, uh, tongues were spoken on the day of Pentecost, and 3,000 Jews were converted. The lame man at the temple in Acts chapter 3 was healed, and 5,000 Jews were converted. And so healing, faith, miracles, speaking in other languages, these supernatural phenomenon were given to confirm the message of the apostles. Now, do we need this stuff today? How do we get instruction today? By direct revelation? Study to show thyself approved unto God. You have everything God thinks you need to know in order to function. The scripture is given for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness that the man or woman of God may be what? Perfect, completely mature in other words and thoroughly equipped for every good work. Pray tell, what more do you need? They didn't have that. And so they needed direct revelations and communiques of special knowledge and wisdom and prophesy. How about protection? Do we have to have a special gift of the Holy Ghost to discern spirits today? We shouldn't, because we have the Word of God complete now, and we can test everything that is taught to us on the basis of thus saith the Lord, and if it doesn't gel, we can reject it. Do we need to see faith and healing and miracles and tongues? Do we need to see supernatural phenomena to confirm the message of the apostles? 
No, because Jesus said, an evil and an adulterous generation seeketh a sign. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I'd like to see some of these healers, so-called, raise people from the dead. Why can't they do that? Paul did it. The apostles, Peter did it. Jesus did it. If these people really had what the apostles had, they would be, listen, they would be emptying hospitals, not building them. Evidently, there's more money in hospitals. See? If they really had what these people had, they'd be emptying graveyards, not populating them. Okay? Listen, we're going to find out in the next session, Satan can and does, to a point, imitate the miracles of the Bible. Now, if you don't believe that, you need to read Exodus 7. Everything that Moses and Aaron did by the power of God, the magicians, the witchcraft people of Egypt imitated. And it isn't that they tried to go one better and do something more bizarre. Oh, well, you guys can do that, but watch what we can do, huh? Satan is an imitator. He's a copycat. He's a counterfeiter. And you don't, you don't fool anybody by printing $19 bills, do you? You got to make it look like the real thing so that even the experts will be fooled. And so these magicians of Egypt duplicated carbon copy the miracles of Moses and Aaron up to but not including the giving of life. See? Then they had to back off and scratch their heads and say, wow, this is the finger of God. We can't do this. See, Satan can imitate the miracles of the Bible to a point, but he can't bring life out of death. It's interesting that these healers can seemingly, seemingly now, effect physical healing. They can't raise from the dead. Wonder why. Wonder what their power source is. You care to venture a guess? Let's talk a little bit more about that, and let's take a 10-minute break till 11.15 and talk about that in the next session. We'll look to God in prayer. Father, again, we thank you for delivering us by the precious word of God from doctrines that are really destructive heresies. Help us to be rooted and grounded in these things, Lord, and not be taken captive by the devil at his will. And we'll praise thee in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, 11.15.